You're listening to the Agroforestry Podcast. My name is Hannah Hemmelgarn. Silvopasture is one of the temperate agroforestry practices with a truly integrated agroecological approach. Trees, animals, and forage plants in one whole integrated farm system. Can it be done? This is a practice that comes with a degree of complexity that can be challenging to overcome, but it's also growing in popularity. I spoke with the Center for Agroforestry's Silvopasture Research Faculty, Ashley Conway, to give us some context. So Ashley, it seems to me that silvopasture is really growing in popularity in recent years. Is that something you've seen too? And why do you think that's happening? Absolutely, Hannah. I feel like that the interest in silvopasture and alternative agriculture systems in general is growing in popularity and interest. And the really ironic thing that I love about this area of research is that it's not new by any stretch of the imagination silvopasture and agroforestry and really intensified um, grazing and animal management systems are old as agriculture itself. And in recent years, we've sort of seen a recurrence of going back toward our roots almost and getting away from our more industrialized monoculture type systems and looking more at ways to sort of hark back to our roots and get, um, get back to really diverse agriculture systems. So silviculture and silvopasture um, is part of that, looking at how we can best integrate and manage intensely um, both livestock, crop, and forest or forage as well. In my mind, I think the impetus for this move, why we're moving and looking more towards intensified and diversified management systems is that we're really starting to push up against our land and water, like our natural resource usability in the world with the human global population growing. Um, We have a huge urbanization move. And so we're looking at trying to produce more food for more people on less land with fewer natural resources available to us. So um, looking at how best to optimize our agriculture systems and animal production systems as part of that is where I really think that this push and this interest is coming from. There's definitely value in all of these types of systems. I think it's important that we we recognize that efficient livestock production is going to utilize the fewest amount of resources. The word we're really looking to use is optimize and what is the optimal. Sometimes what's most efficient isn't always the most optimal in any kind of system. And so what what I love, and as an animal scientist, this is why I get so excited about ruminant production systems, is um, a lot of our land in the continental United States and around the world is not arable land for crop production. And we need to look at ways to utilize that land to produce high-quality protein and nutrition And the best way to do that is ruminant animals because they've evolved ecologically to fill that niche, to use, utilize low-quality forages and scrublands that can't really grow anything else and turn that into high-quality protein and food for for humans or for other animals. Like it's part of an ecological system, right? So for me, bring it back around, Mm -hmm. the interest in these diversified, intensively managed systems for instance, as in silvopasture, is a way to sort of put a microscope on ecosystems and best optimize how an ecosystem is naturally evolved to also not only improve the area around it, but then be able to sustain our population and our people, provide food, habitats, um, social services, etc. Whether you're motivated to pursue silvopasture for effective food production, for animal health and well-being, or for the ecological benefits Ashley mentioned, there's still a lot to consider before jumping in. Dusty Walter is superintendent of the University of Missouri's Wardak Research Center and has been ruminating on silvopasture's complexities for many years. Dusty shared some fodder for thought during this summer's Agroforestry Academy. I think sometimes understanding what it is not is extremely critical to us. Many people just put cattle in the woods and grazing unmanaged woodlots is not civil pasture. So what is it? It comes from the term civiculture 
and pasture. So silviculture is the art and science of tending and producing a forest. Pasture management, growing plants for grazing. At the end of the day, it integrates forestry, forage, livestock practices, and the management of those livestock. So what does that mean? It becomes complicated. But it's also pretty simple. Livestock benefit from shade. You can thin your trees down and grow grass or whatever type of forage is needed. And you can rotationally graze livestock. It can be pretty simple, but it can be made complex too as a system. Well, the first question I think we want to ask is, do cattle need shade? Why do it if the cattle don't need it? Um, and so, do cattle need shade? Well, it depends. Um, number one on are they in grazing and endophyte infected fescue. Endophyte affects the performance of the animal. And so across the Midwest, why do we use fescue? It's a tough grass, but it has some drawbacks associated with it. What about the temperature humidity index? Temperature and humidity affect animals just like it does, just like it does us. So we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Have cattle been selected for short hair coats and heat tolerance? There's some breed selectivity in there. Is there plenty of good water present? What is the overall condition of the animals? Are they healthy or are they already under some sort of stress there? And what are the animals accustomed to? So when is shade probably needed? Above a temperature humidity index of 72. There's a relationship for animal stress depending on the temperature and the humidity outside. Even at a relatively low temperature, like say 75, if you start getting high temperatures, you start getting some mild, or, or high humidities, you start getting some mild stress. So, understanding that relationship there is important. By the same token, if it's 90 degrees outside, it doesn't take much humidity, and your animals are already having a little bit of stress. Um, so what's the effect of heat stress on, on dairy cattle? Mild stress, not bad. They will seek out shade, but the effect on milk production is minimal. By the time you get to moderate, saliva production increases, respiration increases, milk production and reproduction will decrease. And by, if you hit severe, then um, you know, there's a marked decrease. Additionally, for the, for the producers that we're working with, I think uh, local food and knowing where your food comes from has become extremely important and is becoming more important. You don't want somebody coming to your farm and seeing animals stressed out. S salivating, panting a lot, right? Civil pasture has a way to help that. In a study down at the Southwest Center in Springfield, Missouri, so, or just outside of Springfield, Missouri, they looked at cows that were bred and then AI'd prior to the study. They were preg checked and confirmed 85 to 90 percent bred at the start of the study and they provided shade to them. They provided shade and grazed them on different pastures. They had endophyte infected fescue without shade, endophyte infest infected fescue with shade, no endophyte in the fescue, so there are some novel endophyte or some novel fescues out there without the endophyte. No endophyte, no shade, no endophyte, plus shade. You know, when we, when we talk about animals, one of the biggies is average daily gain. And the other, for Missouri, which is a cow-calf state, we're very interested in a percent pregnancy and carrying those animals. So I want you to notice, um, if their endophyte was not infected, with, if it wasn't hot, then uh, shade did not benefit the average daily gain that much. If your endophyte was infected, or your t fescue was infected with endophyte, then it did have a big impact, and especially in both cases, shade helped those animals carry their calves and deliver calves. So it created a less stressful environment for the animals. And so anytime you have fescue, you ought to have shade out in your pasture or available. And then if you're selling calves, in both cases, no matter what type of fescue you were grazing on, whether it was endophyte infected or not, having shade available meant they got better average daily gain 
in terms of weight on their calves. So shade benefits. A different study done by Rob Kallenbach, he did a two-year study out at HARC, Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center, to look at the feasibility of introducing civil pasture as a part of a system. In his study, he used, he used the premise that cattle don't need civil pasture year-round, but they need to have it available sometimes. So he compared two treatments, a traditional with limited shade and an integrated civil pasture that had 25% of the pasture area was in civil pasture. 75% was open pasture. So the traditional was all open, integrated, had 25% had civil pasture available. The end result, the traditional calves, the calves in all open grazing, weighed less at the end of the study than the integrated calves. So where they had civil pasture available, those calves put on better weight. And it resulted in a real dollar value to the producer. What's the mama cow doing all winter long? Providing milk to the calf, right? So she's already got some stress on the system. Um, in the all open system, they lost about 231 pounds over the winter. So they were losing weight over the winter. The integrated system where there was civil pasture available, they only lost 205 pounds. So both of them are under some stress because they're, the calves are, they're supplying milk to the calves. But with civil pasture, they lost less weight. So their body condition was much better uh, at the end of the study. So having some civil pasture, even as little as 25% as a part of your grazing system, can help your cows be more productive for you and your calves yield better weights when they're weaned. So does shade benefit cattle? It does in improved animal condition, improved milk production, improved efficiency of breeding, improved feed intake, weight gain, and perhaps nutrient distribution across the field. But do they need shade all the time? Well, it depends on animal selection, temperature humidity index, whether you're grazing endophyte infected fescue, and we always emphasize rotational grazing, so movement of the animals based on forage availability. This is a convincing line of reason. When animals are less stressed, they're healthier and more productive. But to bring this to life requires careful planning and management. I asked Ashley Conway to shed some light on how it's done. When I think of what this North American landscape might have looked like pre-European settlement, I imagine herds of animals moving together, you know, differently than I imagine, like when we drive across a landscape in the western part of the U.S. now. Animals are kind of really sp- spread out, and it certainly looks a lot different than, than that herd of animals might have looked. So can you describe, well, first of all, what is management-intensive grazing or mob, mob density grazing, and how does that benefit the, the, the ecosystem? So my understanding of mob density grazing is that it's a type of managed intensive grazing, and that managed intensive grazing can look very different depending on what your um, what your operation and what your resources are. Any grazing system that involves um, intentional planning and rotation and utilization of your forage resources, in my mind, would constitute an inten- a managed intensive grazing operation, where you might graze your ground more intensely than you would if you were knew that you were going to leave your animals on the pasture for a continuous period of time. And in doing so, for instance, with rotational grazing, you are stimulating those plants to grow, but by grazing the ground more intensely and then removing the animals off, you allow the plant more time to naturally like regenerate and grow back and then produce more forage in that sense than continuous grazing where the plants don't necessarily have the opportunity to grow back at the same to the same extent as they would if they were being nibbled at once and then moved on. So Mm -hmm. it's a really good tool to more conscientiously manage your livestock systems. If you have fewer land resources and fewer forage resources um, at your disposal, managed intensive grazing is a really good opportunity to 
be able to get the most out of your operation where continuous grazing wouldn't necessarily offer you the same luxury. So again, what the prescribed uh, protocol would look like would depend on what you have and what your resources are, but it's by managing the grazing intensively and intentionally, you're able to optimize your livestock production and your forage production in your setting. So can you explain how that kind of a system can work, especially when you're doing this intensive grazing? Of course. So understanding that you can grow a a strong stand of forage that's perfectly suitable for sustaining livestock, um, ruminant livestock, whether there's trees or not, the marriage of all of these components in a system is what makes a silvopasture system intensively managed because you can't let the trees overgrow and become too shaded. You need to make sure that the forage is still getting enough sunlight um, that that's being grazed to an appropriate level that it can regenerate it when you remove the animals off and not be stunted. Um, and then being able to manage your livestock in such a way that they are reaching their optimal growth levels and being healthy um, in their silvopasture system. So it seems sort of counterintuitive, I think, to a lot of traditional producers to start incorporating trees with forage production and livestock. But what I feel like we need to start or at least continue to share is that there are plenty of places naturally in the continental United States and even in the Midwest where forages and and meadows have evolved with trees as part of an ecosystem. And part of what we're looking at or what we hope to look at in the future is identifying species and combinations of forage, trees, and livestock to best optimize and create a silvopasture system that can work in a lot of different settings. As far as, you know, comparing what producers have to share from their experiences and the research side of what we what we think we know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm really curious in an outreach role where those two perspectives can meet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if the producers are willing to experiment with this, willing to take the risk and try silver pasture, it seems to me that that could really be a, perhaps even more valuable to another landowner who's thinking about trying it than a researcher saying, well, it's you can have up to forty yeah. <laughs> percent. <laughs> you know what's interesting is that as I'm as I'm reviewing all of this literature and diving in, the idea of having model farmers as part of your adoption of technology model is extremely critical. And those voices, those people who have experience and are able to show that it can work in this in this situation, it's inspiring for cohorts or peers who might be in similar situations. So keeping those voices of what we would call model farmers is extremely important because seeing is believing, right? It's going to mean a lot more coming from a peer who's practicing it successfully than it is from a researcher who said, this really works well on my computer or in books, you know? (laughs) Right, or a highly controlled. Yeah, a highly controlled environment. So really trying to find a way to dovetail all of these experiences with empirical research and understand why is it working so well for them in this setting? What factors on model farmer A's um, property are contributing to her success? Or um, And how can we isolate that and replicate that for model farmer B on his farm? Fortunately, one of those model silvopasture farmers happens to be located just 40 miles north of the Center for Agroforestry's home base in mid-Missouri. Greg Judy and his wife Jan at Green Pastures Farm have found tremendous success with mob grazing and silvopasture. Greg's story has been an inspiration for many grazers. He speaks at conferences and has written multiple books, including No Risk Ranching and Comeback Farms. Here at Green Pastures Farm, uh, we run a grass-fed beef operation. That's kind of the centerpiece of this operation. Um, it is a, a breed called South Pole, which are grass genetic. They're bred for finishing on grass. And we've been working at this for about uh, 14 to 15 years. And we switched several years ago to a term called mob grazing, where we're actually bunching the animals together and trying to duplicate what happened on the prairies for thousands of years before we exterminated the buffalo. 
So basically we're using the animals to beat up the ground and get off of it. And so all the dung and all the urine, that hoof traffic is all left behind us and we're always moving forward onto the next fresh pasture. And by doing that, we've been able to eliminate a lot of costly inputs. Uh, we don't put down any seed, uh, you know, just hardly any, any other amendments other than livestock. And so just by using the animals as a mob and moving forward, we're always keeping out of the feces. And so we don't have to worm our livestock anymore. We don't have any parasites. Uh, well, they have some probably, but we don't worm anything and we make them build up resistance. And now our animals, we don't worm anything, not even the baby calves. Uh, so there's no vaccinations because the animals are always being moved on to clean ground. I say the best medicine to give an animal is a fresh recovered green pasture twice a day. And so that's what we're doing. We're moving our animals twice a day. We have one, we have one large mob, about 300 animals, and we're just moving them around, around this landscape. And we've been able to basically double the amount of animals that we're grazing now in roughly about 10 years. So we went from four acres of grass per cow unit down to two acres per cow unit. I call that stacking another farm on top of the one you have. When you don't have to buy additional land and yet you can bring in more animals, uh, that's always a win-win proposition. So with management and moving the animals around, you can actually do some pretty uh, economical things on land today. And we're excited about that. We do uh, direct market all of our animals on the farm. Most of the stuff that we raise is sold directly to the customer. And we do have a few wholesale markets, um, and we, now we've got into seed stock production. And so we actually have good enough animals now that other people are wanting them. And we have a really good market for bulls and heifers. And so that's exciting. That's another, that's another uh, you know, income source that we've derived just from taking our animals and treating them. And basically, folks, we treat our animals well. And we feel like as stockmen, our animals should have a very good life. And they do. Um, that's what we try and do. We give them a good life. Uh, we, we call ourselves the predators in our herd. What we mean by that is any animal that doesn't perform, we immediately get those animals out of the herd. They, they're eating our grass for whatever reason. They're not performing. We just get rid of those. And that's called the predator. In, in nature, every animal that didn't, you know, propagate or, or do well in its natural environment, nature just killed them. That's what happened to them. The predators would eat them. And so we don't have the predators anymore, so we have to be that predator. You've got to remove the animals that don't work. This is a business. Um, it's regenerative. Each year they come right back again. You have another crop. And that's what I love about the livestock business is we are in the solar energy collection business, folks. We're trying to capture every green leaf every day of the year as possible so our animals can feed themselves. Um, we don't put up any hay on our farm. But hey, we do feed, we buy it, we bring it into the farm. And so if you're in the solar energy business, you got to capture sunlight. And we're converting basically a green blade of grass, which is a herbivore, can eat that and turn it into a valuable protein, grass-finished meat. And I think as a consumer, you ought to be darn happy to eat that meat because that farmer is out there healing the landscape, putting animals in their natural environment, Folks, they're a herbivore. They were not designed to eat grain. I'm sorry. That's what they do. They, that's why they've got all the different stomachs. We can eat grass until we fall over and die. But a cow can eat grass and actually put on weight, put on fat, and give you a baby calf every year. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful, it's, that's why it's been around for eons. I mean, that's what they do. So, um, I'm excited about the silver pasture. Um, We've got uh, 1,620 acres total out of the 16 farms. About 900 of that is timber. About 700 is grass. And so if we can go around and create some openings in this timber, especially along the edges where the timber meets the open fields, we call that a transition zone. That's your edge habitat. Uh, we do sell deer hunts. And so we found out that the deer and the turkey are usually along the edge when we build this edge. So we thin the timber out to let the sunlight down. Our key is to try and get sunlight down around on all four sides of a tree. If we can do that, we're gonna grow some forage under there. There's gonna be some forbs coming up. Of course, you get some brush. Uh, the pasture behind us, that was pretty nasty pasture. It was really grown up in brush after I cleared the trees. 
We brought the mob of cattle in there at one million pound stock and density. We gave them just five minute moves. So they were packed in there like cordwood and they absolutely just trampled all that stuff on the ground, manured it, urinated on it, and now we've got a really nice stand of grass and clovers. Um, on seeding, everybody asks me, what do you seed? We don't seed anything except for maybe some cow hooves. We're putting cow hooves down, sheep hooves, maybe planting some fence posts where we need a fence, but we don't plant any seeds. I don't think there's ever been a seeding done that can be done as well as Mother Nature. Think about it. From the time this earth's been created, there's been seed dropped on this land. Why are we bankrupting ourselves going out and buying all this expensive seed when there's seed right underneath our feet? We just need to learn how to graze correctly. And getting into grazing, you've got to get the right tools. And that basically is a poly braid, the, the temporary uh, polyethylene ro little tiny rope. I use the braid because it's a lot more durable. And then we use a geared reel to roll it up each day. And then we use temporary step-in posts. So we've got high tensile electric fence around all of our farms. Uh, on the perimeter, we'll use five strands. I do not want my livestock out on that road. There's too much, well, there's just too much risk. I mean, if somebody hits one, they're gonna be suing you. So make sure you don't skimp on your perimeter fence. Put in a good one and get a good charger. Don't buy a cheap charger. Uh, the other thing on our fencing that we uh, like to do is keep the paddocks bigger. I've ripped out about 80,000 feet of fence over the last 12 years. I'm talking single wire paddock division. I had a lot of little bitty paddocks. That's what we were taught to do. Keep your paddock size larger. I'm saying larger. In my operation, we have paddocks that range from 10 all the way up to 60 to 80 acres, but they're rectangular shaped. So we can take our poly braid on these reels and we can divide these paddocks up. And you can shape your paddock however big you need it depending on how fast your grass is growing. In the springtime, I get this question all the time, Greg, how fast do you rotate your animals? Well, that's a good question. In the springtime, when your grass is growing fast, you wanna move them fast. Well, how are you gonna move your mob fast if you got thousands of these little tiny paddocks and it's all permanent stuff and you got all these gates? Well, what's a gate? when you got water coming down and it's raining. It's a mud pit. We don't have gates anymore. Hardly, we don't hardly have a gate on our farm uh, if we can help it. So we, we just raise the wire up or we'll have a gate you know, going into like a 60 acre field, but the rest of the time it's all daily moves or twice daily moves with poly wire. Uh, the, the, I'll say one more thing about the, the rotation. When, it's, when the grass is growing fast, you move fast. When the grass is growing slow, you move your animals slower. You don't want to come back to your pasture before it's completely recovered. And if you do, you're chewing off the grass, it wasn't recovered, and now that plant has to use the roots to grow back. You don't want to do that. You want to use the grass blade to catch that sunlight up there. That's what it is, it's a solar collector panel. And if you take it all off and it's this tall, you don't have any solar panel left. You need to leave a nice piece of grass behind when the cattle are removed from the paddock. I mean, I like to see, oh shoot, three to six inches of grass left out there. Because I know that's going to grow back quickly, even in a drought. You know, a little bit about, we're talking silver pasture and different type of trees. One of the trees that we focused in on that seems to like to grow out in our pastures a lot is honey locust. And folks, I'll be the first one to admit, I have fought these things my entire life. They're the ones that's got the long thorns on them. But some of them don't. Some of them are thornless. And so we're going in now because they like to grow and we need shade. I want shade in my pastures. I mean, today it's hot out here. I'm standing here in the shade and I got sweat. In you know, Missouri, it's nothing to have 90% humidity, 100 degrees. If you're an animal, I'm sorry, people say animals don't need shade. I beg to differ. If you want to make money with livestock, they better be comfortable. And if they're not, they're not going to make you any money. So we like to have shade. The honey locust, it's a passive shade. So it's got the little bitty leaves on it. It lets a little bit of sunlight through. We're finding out that it is a legume. It fixes nitrogen. The animals come along and harvest this grass under the honey locusts. It's got a lower lignin value in it. It's, in other words, lignin is something that's full sunlight. The grasses have a higher lignin value and they get a lot of sunlight on them. The tree is keeping that sunlight from beating that grass up so bad. And so it's, it's actually a higher feed value. 
uh, honey locust also has the, the pods on them. The pods in the fall are 39% sugar. The old timers used to collect them. They would go out and collect them and fill their barn loft full of these honey pods. And they would feed them to their livestock in the barn because everybody put them in the barn in the old days. They would feed them like corn. And uh, so, yeah, honey locusts, why, you know, everybody said, but Greg, you got the thorns on them. You know, your cattle are going to step on them. I'm like, you know, they've been around for a long time, the honey locusts, and cows are still walking around just fine. Um, so I don't think that's even an issue. But you do have to educate your landowners. Some of our landowners, they will not allow us to use them as shade trees. And so we do have to control them. But some of them are, and I'm excited about that. So we'll go in and prune them and prune them up to where they grow up really nice, get the side limbs off that are low. And the neat thing about a honey locust, it's got a self-rubbing mechanism built into it. <laughs> the cattle will not be rubbing on them because they got thorns on the side. So you don't have to worry about them, you know, tearing up a honey locust. Or sheep, the sheep love honey locusts. They love, they'll eat the beans. That's the first thing they do. When you turn them into a paddy, those sheep will go right for that honey locust. Um, overall on our farms, you know, we got 1,620 acres. Uh, 700 of that is grass, the rest of it's all timber. And we're trying to convert more of this civil pasture every year that we can do that. And we do have our own sawmill now, so we can go in and harvest some of these trees and provide lumber uh, product that way. The shiitake logs is, is another one, and of course firewood. It's all about trying to not just be a cattle farmer or a sheep farmer or a chicken farmer. You need to have a centerpiece to your farm, folks. You need to decide what you're really good at. When you wake up in the morning, what turns your, what, what really turns you on? And if you go to work every day doing what you love to do, you never go to work. It's never a job. So make sure your centerpiece operation, the one that's really bringing in the economics, everything else should be fastened onto that. Okay, that's called the whole lawn, but you need to know what your mothership is. Ours is the grass-fed beef operation. But all this other stuff is just helping out with, with the grass-fed beef. And so that's kind of what we're about. As you might have gathered by now, Silva Pasture has tremendous potential as a tool for improving livestock well-being, optimizing land use, and ultimately steering the grazer mothership towards economic, ecological, and social sustainability. But there are plenty of questions yet unanswered. This is where you come in. Here's Ashley Conway again with a call to action. So I'm so excited to be getting started here at the Center for Agroforestry in Silva Pasture Research because it is such a wide open frontier research-wise. There's so many areas that we have questions about. And what's really important for us as we start building our projects and designing our research is hearing from producers about questions that they have and things that they've done that either have worked or haven't worked or something that they want to try but aren't sure how to. Getting that feedback from the people who are actually going to be using it and instituting these systems is critical. So for me, I see the future of our research at the Center for Agroforestry really involved, heavily involved in producer cooperation and whether that's just one-on-one um, -on -one conversations and farm visits and consultations or having group meetings where you as producers are able to bring your questions and concerns to us so we can start really trying to identify what are the key priorities as far as areas of research. I'm very interested to know how can we manage our intensive grazing optimally for different classes of animals and different species of animals what sort of supplements or additional forage combinations can we include in our silva pasture system to optimize growth and performance? Um, what are going to be the effects of the animals as far as shade and maybe um, pest resistance, internal parasite tolerance? Um, there are so many different species combinations of trees and forage that just that in itself opens up so many doors of how different animals fit best into those different tree and forage combinations um, nutritionally. You know, there's a lot of forages and, and fodder trees that may have anti-nutritional or positive nutritional factors that we just don't know. And the only way that we're going to figure it out is what happens if we have this type of tree planted in this formation with this species of forage 
as a fodder um, source with these the species of animals, say, for instance, cattle in this weight class. I think it's going to keep us busy for a long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, so many different pieces to yeah. consider. In closing, let this be a beginning. Reach out to us at the Center for Agroforestry to let us know what your interests are. We value your input and your partnership. Also, keep in mind, the stories in this episode are focused exclusively on silvopasture with cattle. We'll cover mixed species grazing with silvopasture in a later episode. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Agroforestry and is produced in Columbia, Missouri by Tim Pilcher at KOPN. Thanks also to Manalone Media and the Savannah Institute for sharing recordings from Green Pastures Farm. Check out more episodes of the Agroforestry Podcast and leave us a review to let us know what you think.